Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about marketing. Uh, I'm a marketeer at heart. I've been a marketeer for over 20 years. Uh, I have a lot of experience in uh, you know, 25, 30 different countries, different brands, different markets, uh, from IT tech all the way to uh, beer and the pharmaceuticals, etc. So we thought here at NFE that we would do a series of sort of master classes about marketing, uh, broken down into four different videos so that you can better understand and onboard you onto what marketing is, what it's about, uh, how we do segmentation, uh, branding, brand strategy, communications, communication strategy, and so on and so forth. So if you're interested in marketing or you have your own startup or your own company and you wanna better understand what the marketing people should be doing, then stick around and check out these next four videos. So here we go. To start off, I want to talk a little bit about marketing as a business function. So what is marketing? Well, the reality is that it's a little bit more complex than we tend to like, than we tend to see. Usually when I say, well, are you a marketer? Yes, I'm a marketer. Well, what do you do? Well, I do pay-per-click or I do a search engine optimization. I do SEO or I do content writing for a blog or, you know, these things are technically a part of marketing. So fair enough, but I wouldn't necessarily call that person a marketer. So marketing in itself is a business function. It's a strategic business function. So if you do have a marketing person on board, a CMO, then they definitely should be part of your board. It's a high level strategic business function. Uh, don't get me wrong, search engine optimization, uh, you know, content creation, content marketing, uh, all that stuff is necessary, but all that comes after you have the strategic element. So the bread and butter, I always ask, well, then what is marketing? Well, marketing is complex to explain, but the easiest way that we found to explain marketing is very straightforward. Marketing is selling more stuff to more people for more money, more often, more efficiently. That's it. As long as you're selling more stuff to more people for more money, more often, more efficiently, you are doing marketing. That means that the ultimate result, the ultimate success criteria of any marketer is money. If you're making more money, if you're generating more revenue, you're a good marketer. If you're not, then you're not. It's quite straightforward. There's an objective measurement to how good your marketing department is operating and how good your CMO is actually doing their job. And that's revenue generation. If revenues are going up, good. Revenues are going down, bad. It's very straightforward. Pharmaceuticals, IT, beer, any industry that you are in, the ultimate result of marketing is money. So how important is marketing? And the role of marketing has evolved through the years. In the 1960s, it was kind of new. 60s, 70s, marketing was kind of new. It was kind of taking its baby steps. It wasn't really a science per se at that point. It was more just something that you did to drive revenue was a lot more about ad creation and communications rather than hard data and numbers. Uh, it's evolved exponentially in the past 20, 30 years, especially with social media, especially with, uh, with the internet and all the data sources that we now have. So marketing's role have, has evolved. So is marketing an equal function? So production or, you know, you have your dev team, if you're IT or production, finance, HR, and marketing. So the four main sort of big areas of any business. Uh, is marketing an equal function? Is it 25, 25, 25, 25 across the different functions? Maybe. Or is marketing more important? Is it 40% marketing and then the rest do 20, 20, 20 and they split? Is that what your opinion is? Maybe marketing is the key function. It's everything revolves around marketing as the core sort of function. Or is the consumer, the user, the core? And then ever, all the other functions revolve around. Well, it evolved to a point where about 10, 15 years ago, we saw that marketing became the translator between the consumer, the user, and all of the other functions. So finance teams, production teams, uh, dev teams, HR teams, all of them were coming to marketing and asking, well, what does the user want? Uh, can you give us more information? Do some research, better understand their needs, their pain points, and come tell us what you know the user wants and needs. Now, that again is already old school. It's not like that anymore. The 21st century business is built in a way where all of the different functions know that they are adding value to the customer, value to the user. If every single function in your company understands how they are adding value to your customer, then they tend to be 
better and more successful companies. A good example, let's say you're a bank. So for a bank, if you look at the finance department, the risk department, the guys who are making a decision on whether to give you a loan or not, right? So from them, they don't really understand consumer value that much. Well, they didn't in the past, they do more now. So we went to these banks and we had, you know, I've, had I've had banking clients across different, different countries. And I always ask these finance guys, well, if you can, if you can get your rejection rate from eight days down to three days, why don't you? Instead of asking for 25 different documents, why don't you ask for two? If you can get the eight days down to two days, you're adding consumer customer value. So although you're rejecting them for the loan, you're rejecting them quicker. And that helps them to make decisions better. So once it clicks in their head that what they're doing actually has an effect on the end user, then people start getting on board. Then your company starts to grow. What is marketing not about? very clear. Marketing is not about brand awareness. Marketing is not about logos, graphics, sponsorships. It's not about award-winning campaigns. It's not about promotions, brochures, trade shows. It's not even about getting your customers to love you. It's about none of those things. Marketing is about money. It's about money. You have to be making money. Where do we make mistakes? What are the mistakes that are being made in marketing? Well, the key, the key, key mistake that everybody tends to make when they're just starting out and a lot of businesses still do make is not being human centric, consumer centric, human centric, consumer centric used to be the old way. Now it's actually human centric. You need to be human centric. So what does that mean? Let me give you a really good example. So we were working for a, uh, uh, a government in, in Europe, and we're trying to drive tourism. So the, the project was uh, tourism attraction and, you know, these tourism campaigns for a, com for a country. Well, if you're a country in Europe, uh, your, best, your best target group is probably Germans because they travel the most and uh, they also have a lot of money overall. Uh, they're probably 50, 55, 60 years old plus, so seniors in, in that age range. Uh, they have a lot of time, they have a lot of money, and they love to travel. Uh, they spend a lot of money as well, so they're great for your economy as tourists. So if you have a German tourist that's 55, 60 plus, and they're coming to your country, uh, who's making the decision on where to travel? Is it the husband or the wife? It's the wife. So very straightforward, husband and wife are traveling, wife makes a decision where to come, and then you see an ad like this. This is an ad for Hungary. So when you see an ad like this, that German wife, the 60, 65 year old plus German wife is thinking there's no way in fucking hell we are ever going to Hungary, right? But then why was this ad created to begin with? Well. The ad was created like this because instead of sitting around and thinking who our target group is, who is the human that we want to come here and understand what they want to do and how they want to do it, instead of doing that, they sat down and thought, what do we have? What is our product? If you start from your product, you already have made a mistake. You do not market your product. You market to the human. You have to understand what's in it for them, understand them as human beings in order to be able to sell and sell more. If you can drive product-based functionality, then you'll make money. But if you can put an emotional layer on top that'll drive the human centricity, you will make a shit ton of money. And that is the key difference that almost all great marketers understand. You have to look at people as human beings. So 81% of ads that, we've, that I've seen uh, don't have a call to action. 56% uh, don't describe the product. 48% don't even have the product in the ad. And I'm talking about ads that won the Golden Lion in Cannes. So we're talking about award-winning campaigns. These award-winning campaigns are awesome. They're creative. They look amazing. But the only people that are actually making money from that campaign is the agency that created the campaign. So you don't need to win awards to be a good marketer. You don't care about awards as long as you're driving growth. As long as you're growing, you're doing a good job. So obviously there's an opportunity to do much, much better. How can we do better as marketers? How can we evolve this practice and make it 
better? Well, the number one thing that I, I tend to talk about in this case is human centricity, of course. And that also comes from the fact that I really don't care about my competitors. Now, I, as a marketer, when I say stuff like that, all of my colleagues within the marketing field, like, well, you, you're, you're nuts. You're crazy. What do you mean don't give that? How can you not care about the competitor? They're the ones stealing money from you. Their market share. How do you drive you know, market share? What's your percentage in the market? And you get into this big argument about what is competitors, not competitors, but it's very straightforward from my perspective. Competitors are not relevant to me because competitors are not giving me money. Consumers are. Human beings are giving me money. So whoever is giving me money, that's the person I need to focus on. So here's a really good example. Imagine for a moment you're walking down the street and you enter a nice little park and you're walking through the park and you see uh, two people kissing. So what's your reaction to that? Well, the majority of us uh, will be indifferent. We'll just kind of walk by. Uh, if you're really like in a positive and happy mood, you might kind of see it and smirk or smile. You're like, oh, young kids, you know, in ro romance and they're happy and you know that kind of thing. And then you'll walk by, but more or less, you're gonna be indifferent. Now, imagine the same scenario. You're walking down the street, you enter a park. And when you're walking through the park, you see two people kissing. And out of those two people, one of them is your boyfriend, girlfriend, or is your husband or your wife. Well, all of a sudden, you really fucking care what the hell is going on. You cannot be indifferent, of course. So you go up, you start fighting and screaming and et cetera and et cetera. So same goes for marketing. As long as my competition is not kissing my my consumer, my customer, I really don't care. They can go kiss whoever the hell they want as long as they're not kissing my consumer and my customer. So from that perspective, as long as I am more relevant to my customer than my competition, I will always win. And the way to be more relevant is to focus on the customer and not focus on the competition. So how does all this start? Okay, so I got it. Everybody at NFE here, we're all set. We got it. We have to be more human centric, I understand. Um, you know, we have to be uh, less about the competition and more about the person, marketing as an added value role versus a translation role. But how do we actually do this? How do we implement these ideas into your day-to-day -day life? Well, that is what these videos are going to be about. So where you start from always is destination planning. How do you plan for the future? So mission, vision, stuff like that. I really don't like those wordings that much. You can use the mission, vision. It's very commonly used. But overall, the idea is what is the destination? Where do you want to be in 10 years? Where do you want to be in 15 years? Now, there's a couple of things that you need to understand when you're building that sort of statement, that destination statement. Number one is when you're looking at the 15 years in the future and where you want to be, the first thing you need to assess is where do you think 15 years from now is going to look like? What is the world in 15 years going to look like? You have to give it context. You don't live in a vacuum in space. You live in the world, in real life on Earth. So what does the Earth look like? What does your market look like? What, does the US, what is the U.S. going to be like in 15, 20 years? So you have to have an assessment of where you think the people are going to be, what the mindset is going to be. We're, we're out of Gen Z now, Gen N is coming now. So what is Gen N going to be like compared to Gen Z? Millennials are getting older. So how is that going to impact buying behavior? How, how is that going to impact overall social life? These are the things that you have to know and communicate and understand in order to then have your own vision. So if you don't know the context, you can't put your company's role within that context. So step number one, understand what you think 15 years from now is going to look like, and then what is your company's role going to be in that life, in that 15 years life. Here's a couple of really good examples that have aged extremely, extremely well. So Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates said a computer in every home. We're talking about 1970s here, right? A computer in every home in 1970s is a huge, huge leap of faith. People told him, you are crazy. You are nuts. There's no way there's going to be a computer in every home. No way. I mean, at that time, computers cost hundreds and thousands of dollars, and they were the size of a freaking wall, right? It was insane. But he believed in that vision. He knew that computers must be in every home. People are actually going to use these every single day. And then he knew what Microsoft role is in that context, okay? Uh, Coca-Cola, Ro Robert Woodruff said, a Coke within an arm's reach of desire. So wherever you go, when you want Coke, there is Coke available. 
That was his vision. And again, this is very complicated at the time when distribution networks, it's not like you can produce in the US and ship it off to South Africa. That's not how it used to be. It's kind of easier now, but it was much more complicated back then. Walmart, Sam Walton said, everywhere we are not. That was the vision, everywhere we are not. Now, the important thing to, to understand with these vision statements and these you know, destination statements and the destination statement that you are going to make, it has to have an inherent business function built in. It has to be written in a way and constructed in a way that gives priority to what you want to accomplish. Okay, so once more, Microsoft, a computer in every home. So as soon as they say a computer in every home, they know that the number one thing they need to drive is to make the technology cheaper. Cheaper? and easier to use. So you, it's not $200,000 and you don't need a computer scientist to actually run the machine. It needs to become smaller, cheaper, the technology itself, so R&D, and it needs to be easy to use, so Windows. So they focused on those two things and that's that drove the entire business. That was the locomotive of business growth. For Coca-Cola, a Coke within arm's reach of desire, which means we need to have distribution. We need to be accessible everywhere in the world. So again, they shifted to distribution. The key with Coca-Cola is they use bottlers. So they knew that they can't open up factories everywhere in the world. They're just not big enough to do that. And they don't, it won't grow fast enough for them to have their own factories everywhere. So they said, guys, if you want to open up a Coke factory anywhere in the world, go ahead. Sign an agreement with us, become a bottler, open up the factory, do the distribution yourself, and then we'll give you marketing support. And we'll, of course, we'll give you the recipe and et cetera, et cetera. And that's what they did. That's why you have Coca-Cola company and you have the Coca-Cola bottlers. And again, it was about distribution. Coke within arms reach of desire. Walmart, everywhere we are not. Walmart owns more real estate in the US than almost any other company, except for maybe McDonald's. But it's a massive amount of real estate. We're talking about huge square footage. And again, they're buying up all this real estate because strategy is everywhere we are not. So inherently, once you put that vision, it's not just some words on a piece of paper that the marketing guy wrote so that you can just put it on your website. It's an actual business strategy that's built in. This is not just marketing. This is business strategy. So your business needs to be able to adhere to those priorities that are given within that, that statement. So once you have sort of your destination statement set, uh, then you move into what we call a dashboard. So you have to take that statement and then put it into, okay, I know 15 years from now where I want to be, this is the global end game. But what about next year? What about two years from now? What about three years from now? So when you bring it down to one to three year level, then that's when numbers start getting involved, revenue, revenue growth. Now, the key here is you want to put metrics in place that are human centric. So you don't want to, for example, um, I hate it when they say market share. Market share for me makes no sense. Because market share basically means how big am I compared to my competitors, right? That is what is the percentage. Oh, pizza is this big and this is the my, my slice of the pie. I don't like market share at all because it's not a consumer-centric metric. It's a competitor-centric metric. So if you want to be consumer-centric, for example, a lot of companies now use share of wallet. So the difference between share of wallet and market share is out of all of the bottled waters, for example, the bottled waters that are sold, what percentage is Fiji water? That would be market share. But again, it's not relevant because it's not human centric. So human centric would be out of all of the money I spend when I go to the supermarket, how much of that is Fiji water? That is share of wallet. And that makes more sense because again, it's human centric. I walk into the supermarket. If I buy Coke, I'm not buying Fiji because that's how much money I have. I'm budgeted. So you're not just fighting against water. You're fighting against apples and oranges and a whole bunch of other stuff. A great example of that is, I mean, look at what's happening right now in the US. Black Friday deals are already live. Walmart already has their Black Friday deal ready to go. Amazon Prime, if you're a member, you can already jump in and buy Black Friday. Why? Why, are, why is it like three weeks before the actual Black Friday date? And the companies are already offering you Black Friday deals. The reason is because they understand share of wallet. If you spend your money now on a Black Friday deal on Walmart, then you'll have less money later to spend on their competitors. So they understand that to be human centric, they have to get into your mindset and your budget is limited. So it's share of wallet, not market share. So when you're putting these metrics in place, make sure that whatever you're tracking, there's two key things, whatever number you're tracking, number one is directly related to revenue. So it's driving revenue. 
And number two, uh, very, very straightforward. It has to be a consumer-centric metric. Monthly active users, lifetime value, all these kind of things are consumer-centric metrics. How many people are coming to your site? If you're an IT company, how many are actually buying something, conversion? How, what's the ticket size? So lifetime value. Uh, if you're a retailer or a, you know, a restaurant, uh, visitors, uh, ticket size. So, But they're all consumer-centric. None of them has to be competitive-centric. So I think, uh, I think it's a good start. I gave you some ideas. So once again, just to recap, marketing is a business function. There's no need for the old way of doing things where marketing is translating between consumers and the other functions. Everybody needs to be consumer centric. Everybody needs to be human centric. Forget about the competition. Don't worry about the competition. Focus on your human, focus on your user, and you will win anyway. So that's the sort of the rules, the new rules of the game. And how do we do it? Step one is destination planning. Plan your destination, know the context of the future, put what is your role, make sure your role has a business function built in and start building your dashboard for the next two, three years. So metrics, goals, strategies. From here, next video, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about, well, then how do you target? So understandably, we wanna be consumer centric, but how do you be human centric without targeting? Well, of course you're gonna do targeting, but how do you fix your targeting to be more human centric? How you can get better insights? Uh, from, from there, we're gonna go into branding and brand strategy, and, and we'll end up with communication strategy so we can close the loop and give you better information so that you can be a better marketer. Thank you very much, guys. Please help us out and subscribe. See you next week.